Hello. Good morning. Good morning. So are you known for your socks? Because I thought someone else posted pictures. You know, I didn't, I didn't go fancy today. I just grabbed the first pair. I don't know what they are. They're musical notes and koala bears. Oh, nice. I should have come with no socks just to trick everybody. <laughs> So, good morning. My name's Snuffy Walden. I'm an alcoholic. No. <laughs> Wrong room. Uh, what I was going to try to do today is give you a little idea of, of what the job is. You know, a lot of people, when they think about TV shows and music, they think that, you know, there's a band playing in the background when they're while they're acting on the stage, it's not the way it happens at all. And I'll try to relate most of it to the West Wing, but I'll hit a couple of other things as well. Um, what happens when I, when I get a, an episode of, say, West Wing, is I'll watch the whole movie first. I'll get, a, I'll get what's called a dry cut, which is basically film with no effects and no music. It's just raw dialogue, it's not processed at all. And I'll sit down and watch it by myself and then I'll go into what's called a spotting session. If, if this goes by, that's not gonna be a test so you don't have to worry about any of that. So, so I go to a spotting session where I sit with Aaron and Tommy and, um, and we watch the film and decide where music should be and what it needs to accomplish. And I have a, a music editor with me who's taking detailed notes so that by the time I walk out of that session, I've got detailed notes on, on every place music starts and ends, what, what Aaron said, so I can recall the session. So then, then my job is to really kind of go back and back to my little closet with the, my, my video screen and my, my guitar, or in that case, keyboards, and just start to create music, something that works inside the, inside this, inside the show. Now, a lot of people approach that in a more technical way because you know, they've been to school and they've learned theory and they've been taught how to compose and what, I never learned any of that, so only thing I ever knew to do was sit down and play until something happened. And that's kind of what I, what I do, on, even on guitar. I just find a tempo and a mood that seems to fit for me. And I, I'll give you an idea. I, I did a, uh, a show called 30 something. And, and, and the main, main title, there was a lot of stuff in that show called we called it begging for sex. It was like. <laughs> so, and it was, it was a feel. It was kind of a, a general feel. So what I tried to do when, we, when I wrote the main title for that one was take a, a bit. <laughs> heard it that's kind of what it turned into and it was really just messing around with this kind of popping guitar stuff and that's that's really the way I, I approach it in that particular show there was a lot of wry humor and um, and fun that show was a lot of fun I mean there were dramatic moments and stuff too but but the fun part was was what I've kind of built all this <laughs> popping guitar off of and uh, I was really lucky. I borrowed an acoustic guitar to do that because I didn't own one. 
and uh, and I got really lucky with it. Right after that, I ended up with a show called The Wonder Years, which I promised I'd do this today, which was more like this. Every time Kevin C. Winnie, I'd play this. Which is, uh, I kind of built that into being Winnie's thing. So I digress. Let me get back to, to, where, to where I really was. So I go to this spotting session and I come out with these notes and then I go to my room and I sit and watch the film and try to find a tempo or a color or a feeling that is right for the scene. It may be, uh, in case of the West Wing, I only used the guitar once uh, uh, in the West Wing. I used it um, for Leo going through the woods when he had his heart attack. It's the only time I ever used a guitar in the show. You remember, you remember. I couldn't play that for you now because I don't remember it, but but that was a, 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 a and that choice was, I think I just wanted something so different for him and so different for that moment that I chose to do guitar. Otherwise, I stayed away from the guitar most of the time uh, on that show. So, so I sit down with these spotting notes and there'll be maybe 10, 15 spots where they want music. And then it's my job to figure out, okay, what does Aaron really mean when he says he wants it to be, you know, I want two clouds and, and the dove. No, two clouds and one dove and maybe a little green tree. You've got to kind of interp interpolate all that and kind of try to figure out what they mean. So generally what I'll do is I'll just play until something happens. kind of a matter of, of getting the pacing and finding a mood. For me, it's just playing until something begins to happen. And uh, then I've got to turn around and convince somebody else that this is the right music for them, which is not always so easy. Now, one thing I'll, I have to do, when I talk about West Wing, I'm a little all over the place this morning because I had no coffee. Uh, when I talk about West Wing, I, I wrote the, the entire show on a keyboard. I never really played guitar in it, but I was working on this documentary up to snuff that my dear friend Mark Maxey directed and produced. And uh, when we did that, he said, oh, you've got to play the theme to West Wing. And I'm going, there's no piano. And he said, well, play it on guitar. So you can't actually play it on guitar. I may not play it very well, but this is the way it would sound on the guitar.
to solve it. Because I never get to do it on the show. <laughs> Did I do okay? I've got coffee. You all to bear with me while I have a sip of coffee, won't you? Um, so I never had to do that for Aaron. And if I had, I'd have probably been fired. What's that? Sell the acoustic guitar version? Pull out your iPhones and I'll do it for you all. It is pretty that way, isn't it? Hope you got it. You're welcome to it. I never really, never really did that till Mark made me do it. And I'm not a one take wonder boy much anymore. So, so the job really becomes <coughs> finding music that will support or satisfy the need, or if nothing else, Sometimes music's just a bed to sit there for the actors to rest on. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, well, let me put it this way. You put six good composers in a room and show them all it's the same scene, and they're going to walk out with six different pieces of music. It's, there's no right or wrong. Well, there is a wrong. But... <laughs> But there's no specific right. You can write it a bunch of different ways and make a bunch of different choices, and, and they're all acceptable, and they all, they all will work. There's, um, I didn't do this. I don't have any film to do it with. Lots of times when I, when I play at film festivals, I'll bring some film with me, and I'll play the film with no music, and then I'll play the film with the wrong music, you know, imagine Leo walking through, you know, having his heart attack walking through the woods and you hear. <laughs> Wouldn't be the same as some, um, you know. I should have watched the episode and I'd be able to play it for you. Instead of. I mean, it just would create a different, it, a different energy to it. And, uh, and so my job is really to, to find what best supports the scene. Sometimes what supports the scene best, the best music you can have is no music. And that's where we got to with, with West Wayne. The characters were so developed, and there was such a great bond between the people who watched and the people who were on the screen that you didn't need to say much. You really didn't. I mean, we had twice the music in, in the first year than we did in years three and four. It was just, it didn't need any more. So the, the question was then is how to, how to play softly enough and gently enough so that you didn't overtake the scene or overtake the moment. And, and one of the things that I've always, I've always felt is that the best way I can do my job is if you didn't even know there was music there. If you're watching the scene and you're totally caught up in the, in the feel of it and the story, then 
if I'm playing music, I'm doing my job if you're not noticing the music. Otherwise, it's a guy coming and going, hey, look at me, I'm over here. And uh, the whole point of, of what we do is, is, well, ultimately, it's to make the director like his movie more. But the whole point is to dispense disbelief. Suspend the disbelief so that you can get into the story and get involved in the characters. And, of course, with Aaron, it's much easier than any place else. It's a, sometimes it's as simple as, as a... It's ever so gently just breathing on the scene. By getting quiet, it'll it will draw you into the film, rather than going, "Hey, there's a lot going on here." If you get real quiet, it'll draw you into the film, and it makes and it makes the moments more special. Even that's one of the problems today is they have, you know, uh, I, I do an action show, and it's 25, 30 minutes of pounding music a week, but it never gets quiet for you to feel the inner workings. I mean, it's not that kind of show, it's an action show, but the ones I love are the character-driven dramas. And what you really get a chance to do is to get inside somebody's head and put it through the filter of your experience. And you know, you, you know we could play the same scene for all of you all, and you, you would all have a different experience because of you relating it to what you've been through in your life. And uh, so it, it's a simple job scoring. It's it's a delicate job more than anything. I think that's one of the reasons that I felt like I worked well with Aaron because I just didn't try to get out of the way. There were so many words, you know, they were coming at you like a machine gun all the time, and and I had to accompany that. And generally, it was something simple like, of course, this would be with strings, but. strings and the reason I didn't use guitar because guitar is it's plucking it's like a piano it it's intrusive where a string will just slowly slowly glide in and you can make it come in almost invisibly I'm trying to think of it is there any particular scene you all remember that that I might be able to recall uh oh here we go You know, Aaron picks songs, and he writes them into the script, and then it's everybody's job to figure out how to license the song or how much that's going to cost. Usually it's a fortune. My job sometimes on those is to, to do one of two things. Lots of times I'll have to uh, begin, begin to get the song in people's mind before it ever comes because he never puts those songs at the opening. It's always at the ending or some magic moment. So lots of times he would have me take a song like, um, the money songs. Uh, when you're down 
trouble And you need a helping hand And nothing Nothing is going right So you got a song like that. Aaron didn't ever use that song, but... Uh, so I, I will approach it like in the beginning of my score sometimes. Uh. So I'm not really playing it, but I'm starting to move in the way that song moves. And so what I'm beginning to do is set up in people's minds so that when the song comes, you go, oh, of course. You know, and it's a, it's a form of, it's like a prequel. It's, and, and he would do that to me sometimes, and I'd have to figure out, well, how do I do this? And, and I'd have maybe, maybe if it's a CJ story, I'd have three or four different moments in the, in the piece where I could just start to play a little bit of that theme even three notes of it, and then just move on into some other score. Uh, where he really liked to do me in was songs like um, Brothers in Arms. And, and he wrote that into the script, and then they cut it, and then we got to the end, and the song kept going. And Aaron said, the song needs to end. And I said, well, the song doesn't end. This, you know, we can fade it out. And he said, no, it can't fade out. Why don't you make an ending for it? True story. So I said, you want me to do what? You want me to be Mark Knopfler, you know? And he said, yes. So if you listen to that, that recording of it, it now has an ending of the song. So what happens is over the last 10 seconds of the song, I had to go in and duplicate the sound of Mark Knopfler's guitar and start playing, Mark's, start playing guitar parts that Mark was playing and devise an ending so it actually stopped on the credits. And it, most people don't know, most people don't hear it, because I spent hours and hours trying to match the sounds. But those are the kind of jobs you get to with songs. When it comes to s song supervision, I don't really, as a composer, I stay as far away from that as possible. There's people whose jobs it is to listen to every song in the, on the planet and find good songs. I just, um, it's not something I do well or I'm really particularly interested in doing. Uh, but a lot of times I have to do the work to, to come into the song. Maybe it'll start here, and I've got to figure out how to get there. And then the song will start. So my job will be to gracefully let the music start and switch it from a song with, without the ear catching it and going, oh, now we're hearing a song. It's got to be very fluid. Because you don't ever want to go, oh, what are they doing with the music now? You know, I want you to be involved in the story. You had a question? Yeah, I, wanted, I was wondering if you could get into that strings note that lives throughout all of the seasons. It always seems to come in right when something magical is happening between characters. I, I don't know if you know the note I'm talking about, but there's, there's a certain You gotta realize I wrote these sometimes in you know, yeah. thirty six hours. So who knows? It's probably just silence, and then the the you know the strings will start. Well, most of the time I'll just feather it in. And the why I bring this and I use strings particularly in those moments, especially in West Wing, is is because it comes in comes in very silently, and you don't hear really where it begins and I'll just glide the music up so that it feels like it's coming out of the air in the room. Yeah, and, and what you try to do is you try to make those moments, there's a, I don't want to get too technical, there's an arc of a, of a scene in, in writing. When I first started scoring, I was working with Ed Zwick and Marshall Herskovitz, and they didn't know anything about music, but they taught me how to write like a scriptwriter. 
and they said, you know, there's an arc of the scene, there's an arc of this one you know, soliloquy, there's an arc of a scene, there's an arc of a whole episode, there's an arc of a story, there's even an arc of a whole series if you go year to year to year. And building that arc and knowing where the climax to that arc is in any scene is what you're building around. With 30-something, they always wanted me to be another character to comment on the scene. And so I just would leave the scene alone and then I'd, you know, <laughs> play a little something at the end of it. With West Wing, it was totally different. You had to be seamless all the time because there was so much coming at you with like a machine gun. Um, when it got quiet, those were the moments you you really could barely even blow on. And that's why you know the strings worked great with there occasionally an oboe, but most of the time, not even woodwinds. Most of the time, a gliding string. It's interesting you bring that up. I, I don't ever think about it. It's probably my, my little tool that I keep in my bag to get in quietly. <laughs> Maybe I overused it, but yeah. One of those moments I was just thinking is when Charlie tells Leo that this is like uh. And the rest is all just your music, no words. And you took, like, it's a good minute, minute and a half of your strings. Do you remember that? You know, I remember the moment, but I couldn't tell you. I mean, I wrote so much music for the West Wing. And, yeah. Right. So, were you still working up to the last minute? Were you writing the music for the first part of that two or three episode storyline before you knew how things were going to really Yeah, happen? yeah. Well, I generally try to ask Aaron, and sometimes he would say, I don't know where it's going. <laughs> yeah, I had to generally create themes. A lot of times, if we had a storyline going through multi shows, I would create a theme. So, because what happens is, if you have a character and uh, say she loses her dog, sorry, my wife will hate that. Uh, she loses his, her dog, and and you play this theme, you know, when she's putting her dog away or, or burying her dog's collar or something. Then later on, you can be in a love scene, but if you bring in that same theme, it brings in the depth of what she's been feeling. Even a love scene, and all of a sudden you play that same theme, and you get to recall, or the viewer gets to recall, well, she just buried her dog, or CJ's dead, or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> oh, no, 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 we don't kill CJ. And now you can find her on Mom. She's on. But, but it, to that, themes are written. Um, a lot of the time I'll pick it, I'll write a certain theme for a certain story, and it will morph over time as the story morphs, but, but the theme will kind of remain intact. So following on that, you mentioned the other day that you, you were often waiting for pages from Aaron, which a lot of actors have spoken about, but then you also mentioned watching a scene. So can you talk about that process flow of what you're thinking of conceptually and then how you refine it once you were you able to see scenes to refine the, the, the score? Yeah, they had a... They, this will give you a window into their process. Because we had the set all the time, and we had the actors all the time, uh, they would shoot an episode and bring it in and start editing it, and then Aaron would go, no, that's not working. He would write a new scene for it, or he would change something. And they'd go back down to the stage two weeks later and shoot another scene that goes into a show that we've already shot. I mean, so it was like a jigsaw puzzle some of the time. and. Part of my job was to make sure all that flowed because you go from one day to a week and a half later trying to shoot the same scene to get it to match something that's already in the scene. It, it's pretty tricky. So my job is to smooth, you know, I'm kind of a Swiss Army knife, really, when you, my job is to do a lot of things. It's to cover some stuff up. It's to help some moments. It's to get out of the way some of the time. Uh, it was very unconventional style of shooting because we had everybody all the time because it was such a big ensemble cast 
that we could pick up stuff for episode 16 that we didn't shoot until we were shooting episode 20. But by the time it got through the editing process, Aaron would look at it and go, it's, it's just not right, the story's not complete, or he would have written a new storyline and we had never seen earlier that, that set it up. So it was always in a constant, constant change. I tried not to write until the film was locked. Locked means they've actually cut it and set it in stone which they don't even do that anymore. They latch it now. <laughs> yeah? Um, what is a typical uh, length of time, uh, lead time, uh, once you receive that cold video? Uh, how much time goes by before it actually gets on the air? There were times with, the, I mean, traditionally it's a five day process, five, five or six day process. With Aaron it was sometimes a day and a half a day. Uh, I mean, literally, what I wrote became the performance you all heard. Uh, after the first six episodes, I never used an orchestra again. After the first six episodes, it was all done with samplers and synthesizers, and it's just me playing. But we'd established the sound of the orchestra early on, and the main title was orchestral, so people never doubted that what was going on during the show wasn't an orchestra, so people never really kind of busted me on that. Yeah. So, first of all, thank you so much for playing with you, Steve. Ah, uh, yes. I do have an actual question. Um, my question is, and this may be more Wonder Years than Wesley, but were there ever times in the spotting session they said, we know we want music here, but we're not sure yet if we want original score or pop song, which they'll figure that out, or by the time they got to the spotting session, they knew what they wanted? Yeah, there are times where, well, that happens three different ways. They'll show up and they'll, they'll say, oh, we, we think we want a song here, but we don't know if we can clear it yet. Would you write something and then we'll just throw it away if we don't get the song, which <laughs> never goes over well with a, with, with a composer. But they do that. They really do. And they said, just so we're covered, write that four-minute cue, you know, like it takes 10, 10 minutes. It, that, that's like an whole afternoon. Uh, or they'll say, we have this perfect song, we can't afford it. Can you rip it off? <laughs> Which is really not fun. Because you can play, I could, I could play an, a James Taylor song, and if I had it perfect and had a guy who could sing just like James Taylor, and we could match it note for note, it's still not going to feel the same. There's something about those records that we experienced as we were growing up and the music and the way it imprinted, a sound alike just doesn't cut it. And I always tell them, I said, you're better off buying the song, you're just gonna feel cheated the whole time. And sometimes they'd buy the song, sometimes they don't. The, the other thing you get into is they say, well, we really want this Rolling Stones song, but we can't afford it, so do something like the Rolling Stones. And that's <laughs> always awful. It's always awful. You, yeah? Um, I have a coworker who is uh, into music, and he has something called synesthesia, where he actually hears music and sees it in his mind as colors. You mentioned about color. Do you have something similar? Meaning, as in, do you see music in color in your mind, or do you? I mean, or how do you? How do you work music in your mind? You That's it? probably the hardest question in the world. You know, I. <laughs> I don't know because I'm not a studied player. Um, I've just got to play something until it feels right. And I, I and what I know what you're saying is well, what's the germ of what you start with? Well, for me, it's this, it's just playing and getting into the music. instrument and this instrument's gonna make me play the way I do so I just start to play 
and then a feeling comes over it, and, and I, I, when I'm doing this, I'm always staying locked to picture, so I'm recording locked to picture, and I'm looking at picture and just playing things, and then when something emotionally starts to happen, then I'll sit down and work on it and make it fit the scene, give it the air and the timing to fit the scene. But I always start with something, and, and I don't know where it comes from. I, I think it comes from above. It, I, the best music I write doesn't come out of me. It comes to me. Yeah, Mike? Yeah, can you tell us about how the, uh, the main title for the West Wing came? Yeah, you all probably don't know this. Did, did anybody ever watch the West Wing? <laughs> <laughs> Over and over again. Uh, you all are ahead of me there. I, we were working on the show, and originally Aaron wanted a guitar show. I was doing Sports Night, and Aaron said, you know, I'm going to do this little political drama. Would you be interested in doing it? He said, I'm thinking it's Americana guitar. So I'm thinking, my, my, Miss America. You know. And uh, I said, sure, I'll do it. And... Then they, they shot the pilot in April, and they're starting to put the whole cut together. They've got to pick up, and they're starting to put the whole cut together, and Aaron comes to me and says, well, listen, you know, we're putting this orchestral music up against it, and it's really working good. Do you, do you think you can do that? And I, I didn't know if I could or not, but I said yes, of course, because <laughs> uh, I was going to be out of work if I didn't say that. And... So we got started on the show and I got really involved. We didn't have a main title. At that time, Randy Newman was writing a main title for the show called Our House. Um, a couple other people were writing songs. It was, you know, everybody wanted to get on this Aaron Sorkin show. I just had my head down and I was working. And uh, in the last scene of the third episode, we were scoring them in batches of three at that time. So. The first three, I wrote the pilot, I wrote half of the episode two, and wrote two cues for episode three. And by the time I got to episode three, I had a, a scene, you all remember it, when Dulé, Charlie, shows up at the, at the Oval Office and they're doing the first taping from the Oval Office. And there's this theme in there that goes... <laughs> Tommy Shlami came over to my house just to preview some of the cues, and, and he listened to that cue, and he said, that's our theme. I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's our theme. Write it for a minute long. So what I did was, uh, that first scoring session, it wasn't orchestrated or ready to be done, so for the first or uh, orchestra session, there was no main title for the show. So we used a synth mock-up on episodes two, and I believe episode three, there's a synth version of the main title. It's not the, the orchestral one. If you ever go back and listen, it's, it's note for note, it's virtually identical, but it's played on synthesizers instead of on, a, with a real orchestra. You, you put them, you A-B them, and there's no, there's no comparison. The live musicians performing music is so much richer than playing it on a synth, you know. Uh, there's just no, that human touch and, and a, a room of 50 people trying to express one thing is so much more powerful than a really good sounding string patch. So if you ever get a chance, roll by it. Uh, it's not that different, but put them up next to each other and you'll really tell the difference. Uh, so it came out of that. It came out of that scene where, ch where we pull back and and, and Charlie's watching the president, and he's doing a, a scene. So I pulled it out of that and played it for Aaron, too, and Aaron loved it. And my best story about the, the main title is I was playing it, uh, doing a rundown in the orchestra in the second session we did, which was for episodes four, five, and six. And uh, I had the orchestra run it down. Now, Aaron knew the theme, but he'd never heard an orchestra play it. So he came in, and he was sitting behind me, and we did the first rundown, and it got to the end, you know. Uh, and it just hung there. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get fired. And I, I, I turned around, and Aaron had a tear in his eye. 
And, and that's the way Aaron responded to music. Aaron was like, he was so intense about his words and so intense about the staging and everything about the piece. When it came to music, he was like a kid. He, if it moved him, it moved him. And, and he never came at me and took it apart. I mean, he might say, I really need, I really need tears here. And then, you know, I, it's Aaron, so you do your best to get tears there. But he never really, and I don't want to use the word came after me, he never really picked apart what I was doing. As long as it was emotional, and as long as it worked to get what he wanted, that's all he cared about. And, and lots of times you'll walk in and, you know, a director will tell you, well, you're playing a B seventh there, can you make that a B flat nine? And, you know, they get real involved in what your process is that doesn't work as well because, at least for me, what I'm trying to do is convey an emotion and support an emotion. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting job. It, it really is. It, I don't think about it much except when I have to talk about it. And it covers so many facets and just lots of things you got to do. Aaron was a delight to work with. He was on all three shows I did. You've got a question. Night, we got to hear that performance by the chalice. Uh -huh. the, that first, like, Yo Yo Ma piece, or the piece that was in the show, that did you, like, talk with Aaron about, like, what piece would really, like, hit Josh that way? Or Aaron wrote all those pieces, all those pieces of music, whether it's Kev Mo singing the national anthem, or that was all Aaron. Aaron wrote them into the scripts. And occasionally, I mean, the jackal, all that stuff, that's all written in the script. Um, no, we didn't, we didn't interface at all on songs except when he needed me to do something with a song that he had, but that he wanted it to end earlier or that he wanted me to, to, to build up to that song being the climax in which I'd use bits of the theme up until that moment uh, without ever giving away what song it is. I mean, Aaron, Aaron knew what he wanted. He really knew what he wanted. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm, well, you make every mistake, you know, in the book. I mean, when I work with somebody, I tell, I tell them, listen, you've got to allow me to be absolutely horrible so that I can feel loose enough to do something that's really great, that really works. And so, you know, sometimes the first three or four sketches I throw in, people go, what? No. And, uh, but I try to make sure that they have the freedom, that I have the freedom, and that they're open-minded enough for, for something magical to happen. Um, and yes, it gets easier uh, in some ways, and because you know the characters and you know how to slip in, and you know their pacing, their timing, their phrasing, you know, you know how Josh is gonna wait a minute and, look back and then you can play. You can't step on that moment, you know, you've got to. The other thing that happened with that show is we gave less and less music to the audience because as the show went along, we didn't need to hit them over the head with it. I mean, if you look at the first couple of episodes, they're much denser pieces of moving music and, and then as we got deeper into the show, it's much more soft touch because the characters are so well developed and the stories were so rich that I didn't have to do much. I, I had to do it right, but I didn't have to do much. So it's, it's shows are like that. They, they all take on a life of their own. <coughs> yes, in the back. Either one of you. Josh thought of Donna or something like that. <laughs> or anything like that. 
You know, West Wing was funny that way. I tried. I don't know if you all noticed. <clears throat> a lot of times in a show, if you've got a theme like the West Wing, you're going. You know, every other beat you're going. <laughs> Or you're playing it on a banjo or something. I used the West Wing theme very sparingly in the show. Rarely would I use it as underscore, maybe twice a season. Uh, I'd, I'd intimate at it. I, you know, you know, I might go. use a little phrase from it, but I rarely went down, 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 down. Uh, I thought it overused it, and when the piece first came together and people responded to it, I knew it had a special place for people, uh, having nothing to do with me, but just the resonance between the story and that melody spoke to people, and I didn't want to overuse it. I didn't want to make it trite. So, you know, I used it maybe, uh, was it the Let Bartlett be Bartlett scene where Bartlett's walking down this long hall. I'm, I, I can see the scene in my mind. I used it there. I'd use it in really impactful places where it really needed to speak of the show, but I tried not to use it. And uh, so I had to find other ways to do it. Uh, you know, most of the time as we got into it, unless I wrote a particular theme for a, a character or a story, I was just playing the moments and, and letting them be. I didn't really, wasn't overthought. I was never, number one, I didn't have the time. I mean, no time at all. Yes, in the back. You're not supposed to ask that question. Yes, you're not supposed to ask that question. <laughs> because the purists here are going to say, I told you. I told you it was different. Yeah, it was different when John came on. But it was way more organized. <laughs> Truly. Those, those, those dailies got out, and I got my five days to score the show. And... <laughs> It was harder. I mean, you were going from somebody's voice to somebody trying to keep somebody's voice. And uh, it's, you know, it's, if it's not Aaron, it's not Aaron. I mean, it's, it's just he has a particular rhythm and tone and a feel. Uh, it was a little bumpy, those first four or five episodes, because we weren't sure we were going to be able to make it work. And then it started getting into a rhythm of its own, and the characters... Thank God for the actors. They kept it uh, pretty cohesive, although the stories really kind of changed a lot in, in fabric. It became more of a regular drama, I think, than um, Aaron's commentary and Aaron's take on, on how the big things in, in politics really make a difference for, the, for people. And, and he had that amazing ability to, to bridge that gap, you know. It, it it was a little more difficult, and also I had a new job, uh, a new boss, because I'd never worked with John, and he had just come off a run with ER, where he was king of the world. So John was always great to me, and he's a friend today. Uh, John did things that nobody else would ever do. John gave a huge bonus to all of us, in everybody, everybody in the crew. At one point, when he sold West Wing, that went out to Bravo and all these different places. He actually wrote very large checks to everybody in the cast and crew, just as a, just as a thank you. And and I've I've been in my this business thirty years. I've never seen anybody do that. So John is one of the most gracious, uh, well-meaning men in the world. He's a great showrunner, and the only problem he was up against is that he was trying to take on for Aaron, which is a difficult question. But John's delightful, and he runs a show, runs a tight ship, and, and you know you're going to have the time to do your best work. You didn't know that with Aaron. You, you didn't know if you are going to get three days or one day to do my job. And then I just worked until I ran out of time and money. You know, it's very, it's very simple. But it was different, 
But I think everybody still felt like we were doing the West Wing. So if that answers your question. Um, I know Aaron's background is in musical theater, and I was wondering if he had ever talked about writing a musical with Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Not the West Wing musical. <laughs> No, it's a great idea. I mean, <laughs> I think he's got uh, something he's going on. Kill Mockingbird right now. On yeah, Broadway. right. He's doing something on, on Broadway. I don't know. He's not. He's not really interested in doing television right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's really kind of. He says he's done with television. I don't believe that. But <laughs> did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. There's a friend of mine, Tommy Newman. Do you guys know who Thomas Newman is? Uh, when he did this uh, score, what was it, American Beauty? American Beauty. He did this score, American Beauty, that was <coughs> everybody in, in Hollywood tempted it and, and would use it as temp music. And I kind of came up to him one day, and I said, I'm so tired of having to rip you off. And he said... <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, so am I. <laughs> because everybody wanted him to do the American Beauty score, you know, and he didn't want to do that. He wanted to do something else. So yeah, I've had to rip myself off. They said, can you give me that 30-something thing? I said, well, I can a little bit. Uh, but I went down that road too far one time with Tom Arnold. Uh, I was doing a show for him called Jackie Thomas, and he wanted me to get this, he wanted this metal song, but he couldn't afford it. And I, I'm trying to remember. So Tom said, oh, play something like that. So I got the tempo and kind of the guitar sounds, and I played, you know. Um, and he said, no, that's not close enough. And we kept going back and forth, and finally he said, that's perfect. And the next day I got sued. So, you know, so I tell him now, I can't get that close. I can't get that close. But I, I tried it once, but it was, it, was a, it was a disaster. And the company that sued us was the company that owned Tom's show, which was really weird. But Black Sabbath or whoever it was didn't like using whoever it was. I don't know. Oh, really? Oh, I thought we were here till 2. There's a question over there that I can't see. I'll tell you exactly how that happened. That's the question is, can you tell me a little bit about the end credit music because it's so up and jovial and happy, you know, which is after someone gets machine gunned, you don't want everybody to hear that. <laughs> the truth is, we were going so fast, they said, what are we going to do about end credits? I said, cut a piece out of the opening of the pilot and put it in there. And that's what that's from. It's one of the upbeat pieces from the pilot. And I generally don't write an end credit unless it's for a specific reason. But from a business point of view, I always have a different main title than the end credit, unless we really just want to rephrase the theme. Um, financially, it's better. It, you get, there's some BMI things that go in there. But uh, I generally don't spend time writing music for credits. Number one, by the time I was really doing it, they were squashing it off to the side and talking over it the whole time anyway. So what you see on a DVD is not going to be what they saw on television. So, Yes? Can you tell me what style of music you personally prefer playing or listening to? Well, I grew up playing by ear and playing blues in Texas, so I guess that's where my roots are. Uh, I always want to play the stuff I don't know how to play. Uh, 
but probably blues. I mean, when I sit down. I, I play more in a bluesy or jazzy style. But when I'm doing a show, you can't do this. I couldn't play this on a show. Uh, I, you have to find a palette and a group of instruments that weave together for a tapestry, and then you take the tapestry apart for the show and use the threads of it for different, different kind of applications. So what I play when I'm just playing is totally different than what I write. But I do write very simply. I'm a very simplistic writer. Uh, the theme to West Wing's just a simple little gospel tune that I played on piano. So, and then now it has soaring French horns. But if you get it down, it's very simple. It's almost. Well, it's not far. All that comes into mind when you do this stuff. One more. Right. Could you just give us a short little background of how you got to what you're doing now? I started, my, my family liked the arts, and they made me do tap dance, and they made me uh, play, you know, instruments around the house. But I first started at five years old on a Hawaiian steel lap steel guitar, and then I moved to piano lessons, Ugh. and then <laughs> tap lessons. And then in third grade, I started playing uh, trombone, and then I played a baritone. But when I hit the ninth grade, I was given a guitar. My brother and I were both given electric guitars, and uh, within two weeks, he took two of the strings off his, and he became a bass player, and I became a guitar player. And we just kept playing. I mean, I never intended to have a career, but I was just having a great time. Did my first record when I was 15. Did my first tour when I was 15 with B.J. Thomas. I mean, did, you know, just got immersed in it and then ended up, uh, I was in pre-med, I had an FM radio underground show and I was working for $7 a night at a strip club. And the first thing to go was college and then the radio show went and the next thing I knew I was playing guitar in a strip club and it was <laughs> having the time of my life, so. I just have always made my living playing, except for one year when I got sober, I quit, I put music away, and then got it back times 100, so. Ah, <laughs> thank you all, thank you all. Oh, you all are so sweet. I hope I answered some questions. Thank you guys. Yeah, what do I have today? Uh, I have, what does that say? Jammin' Country Bears, Jammin' Country Bears. You're so welcome.